Hey everybody, it's Gil here with the Sailing Vessel Dream Chaser, and this week we're going to talk a little bit about coronavirus and COVID-19 and what we're doing as a family to protect ourselves and what I think is a very practical and logical approach others can take as well. For anyone that's watched this channel, you know for a fact I am not a doctor, I am not a medical professional, but I do pride myself in being practical and logical around the way I tend to approach things, to look at things not only uh, from a personal perspective, but a broader perspective. And I do think when it comes to being practical and logical, there's probably no better time than right now as we're seeing this consume the news, consume people's thoughts and actions. And while it's important and we certainly need to respond in an appropriate way, I do think that this is a time when um, some practicality can really, really pay off for all of us. So I want to share some information, a little bit of background, what the disease is, what the virus is, how you can track it, um, things you can do on a personal and a family level to protect you and yourselves, um, as well as a broader picture of what this means for our communities and how else to think about this beyond just us personally. Last week, we took you aboard the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Ingham. What a cool, cool experience. So as a sailor, as a mariner, um, being able to go on a Coast Guard Cutter was a pretty special thing. If you didn't see that video, I will put a link to it right up in this corner up here. Uh, by all means, check it out if you're interested. Uh, but let's jump into this whole virus discussion. I'm going to share my take on this thing. My take. Um, this is based on the research I've done and the approach that I'm taking with our family. But obviously, this is a personal issue and it's something that you have to decide as far as what's best for you. And obviously, you wanna take guidance from medical professionals that you see fit. And if you are in a higher risk category, certainly you'd wanna take whatever precautions are necessary. Um, again, this is my personal approach. I think it's logical and practical and it, uh, it, it, based on the research I've done, is a very good approach. So I'll be happy to share it with you, but also understand that you know disclaimers are required, right? Not a medical professional, not medical guidance. This is my approach. Um, and, and when I say a disclaimer, it's funny, right? Like if you go to a McDonald's drive-thru and you get a cup of coffee, it says, caution, coffee is served hot. Well. That's there because disclaimers are needed, right? So um, I, at the end of the day, my opinion, my approach, you should certainly seek the advice of professionals, but I'm gonna quote some of those professionals in this, this week's video. Additionally, I should say that I am doing this based on somebody living in the United States and what I'm seeing around me in the United States. Um, obviously, as you've seen in the news, this is a worldwide pandemic, uh, actually is impacting other countries significantly worse than it is impacting the U.S. Um, but because of where I sit, where I am, um, this is from the viewpoint of somebody living in the United States. Um, I think there's a lot of this that is applicable outside of the U.S., but I just wanted to at least share that that's the lens by which I'm approaching um, this video. And we do have some viewers that are outside of the U.S., so bear with me while I, I get a little bit regionally specific here. Um, but like I said, I think this is applicable more broadly as well. So what is it? What is coronavirus? We see it all over the news. Coronavirus, which is what everybody seems to be referring to it as, actually has a more technical name. The technical name to it is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2. That's the official name of the virus. And that virus, if you get infected, can turn into a disease, and that disease has a technical name of COVID-19. So in Wuhan, China, where this disease was first reported, that is where um, the virus Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2, formed into the actual disease called COVID-19. So to put this in another analogy, I think a lot of people are very familiar with HIV, the virus that can cause the disease AIDS. This is very similar. SARS-CoV-2, uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, is the virus that can cause the disease COVID-19. It's an important distinction because not everybody that gets SARS-CoV-2, the virus, will actually develop into the disease COVID-19. So I think that's an interesting designation, something I wanted to just sort of share as we baseline the rest of this discussion. For people that develop the disease COVID-19, it has a few um, symptoms. Coughing, fever, 
and respiratory breathing problems, challenging breathing or shortness of breath. Those are the symptoms. But what's interesting is not everybody actually displays symptoms that has the disease COVID-19. That's the big challenge here because there are people that potentially are infected and don't know. Another interesting fact is about 80% of the people that actually get um, SARS-CoV-2, right? Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, the virus, and also then forms into the disease COVID-19, 80% of those people will recover with no medical attention. So because this is a virus, our bodies fight this virus off. If this were a, um, a bacterial infection, then antibiotics would be very useful. But because it's a viral infection, uh, it, it re relies on the body's antibodies to essentially fight that off, especially now while there is no vaccine, there is no sort of cure at this particular point. Um, that's the reason why the most vulnerable people are either the elderly or people with compromised immune system or underlying health issues because their bodies aren't as prepared or aren't as strong to fight off that particular disease, the virus COVID-19. So let's start there. That's an interesting stat. 80% of the people that develop the COVID-19 virus completely recover with no medical attention. Um, now, there's some precautions one should take, by the way. You shouldn't have this and be out in public, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes, but that's an interesting stat. For the people that do develop COVID-19, the, the remaining 20%, one in six of those particular people will actually develop a severe health issue. Um, it can be everything from pneumonia to emphysema, um, and, and frankly, those are the issues that have caused the largest number of deaths here in the US. It tends to be the elderly, where they have compromised immune systems or weak immune systems and can't fight off the pneumonia and or emphysema that comes from this. The spread of COVID-19, or the virus itself, happens when people cough or sneeze. Water droplets expel from people's bodies during a cough or a sneeze. And if those water droplets infected with that virus get into another person's body, either in their mouth, their nose, or their eyes, those tend to be the passages by which um, pathogens get into our body, that is the way that we spread the disease. Now, I can't think of the last time somebody sneezed directly in my face. So you think, oh, well, not that big a deal, right? But it is, because unfortunately, those sneezes or coughs, those water droplets land on different surfaces. Or, how many times have you seen somebody cough into their hand? <laughs> then they take their hand and they, they're holding the handrail, walking up a set of stairs or opening a doorknob. That particular um, virus now potentially has been moved to that surface. This virus can live on surfaces. Uh, it's unknown exactly how long, but I've heard as long as five weeks. I don't know how true that is, but it can live on surfaces. And now I walk behind them, I rub that handrail, that doorknob, and then I go up and I touch my mouth, my nose, my eyes. I have just taken that virus that they put on their hand, onto that surface, from that surface, onto my hand, into my body. And I become the vehicle by which I infect myself. So that's the way this disease and this virus is spread. And if you just want to think about something, think about how often you touch your face. We've all been paying attention to it. If you've been watching the news, you know that's one of the things you should try to do is not touch your face. And I've been making a really conscious effort of it. And it's amazing how often we rub our lips, rub our nose, rub our eyes. Um, we do it frequently, very frequently. So it's an interesting thing. Just think about that. And then you think of all the surfaces that you've touched. So there's the background. There's what it is. There's how it spreads. And it all sounds pretty terrible, right? But I do think the reality is there are some things that we can all do, fairly simple things. And by the way, these aren't my ideas. This is coming from the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization. And then it has my sort of practical approach to how I do these things for our family laid on top of it. And it's pretty simple. It's seven steps. That's it. Seven simple steps that we're all taking. And I'm going to go over these. Um, I'll go over them one by one and we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. The first one, number one, stop freaking the fuck out. That should be number one. People are going nuts. Like when we go to the store and you see empty aisles and somebody bought all the toilet paper and everything and dish soap there is and all the canned goods. Like at some point, folks, I get it. You're nervous, but let's not hurt the communities around us. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Just <laughs> please stop freaking out. Be smart, be logical, protect yourself. Don't be naive. Don't do risky things but you don't need to go buy all the toilet paper at your local store. That's number one.
Number two, wash your hands often. Hot soapy water, wash your hands between your fingers, tops of your hands, up your wrists, wash them frequently. We all do this now at our house, everybody. When we leave the house and anytime we come back, we immediately wash our hands. So if we're running to the store or whatever, we immediately wash our hands, hot soapy water. If we are going to be in a location for an extended period of time, more than an hour or two, we may very well wash our hands more than once. So if we were to go to a restaurant, we may very well wash our hands after we order the meal, after we finish the meal, and then again when we get home. Not a very difficult thing to do, but certainly something you should consider. If you are not able to wash your hands, if you are in a public place that doesn't have a place for you to wash your hands, then I would suggest carrying around a little bit of Purell, right? Certainly, you know, use that on your hands. Um, because everybody went and did number one, freaked the heck out, that's, the aisles are empty. Um, there are a couple of alternatives. I, I'm not going to go into all the details on them, but I will share with you something that's been very successful for me. A lot of times when you, um, when you have an infant, you don't use alcohol-based sterilization products or, or antibacterial products. So if you go to the infant and baby aisles in your local store, not everybody knows to go buy those things, but they will have alcohol-free sanitizers. They typically come in a small bottle, just like a Purell. You pump the top and it has a foam and it works exactly like the other does. Very similar to what you see in hospitals and stuff when you wipe your hands. That is another great way to do it. And in my local stores, despite the fact that all the Purell is gone, um, those items are still there. That's number two. Number three, I mentioned before, try not to touch your face. It's a real effort, but let's avoid doing something that's risky. Try not to touch your face as often as you can. And if you are gonna to touch your face, wash your hands first and then do it. Just a smart approach, try to pay attention to that. That's number three. Number four, number four is something you should do all the time, not just during this time. If you have to cough, into your arm or your elbow, <coughs> as opposed to into your hand. So. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, it does signal to other people around you, especially if you're in public, that you know how to be protective. If I cough in my hand, I mentioned I translate that to handrails and banisters and doorknobs and all the things people touch. When's the last time you touched something with the inside of your elbow? I've never opened a doorknob with this. I've never held this on a set of stairs. Very infrequently is this portion of your body making physical contact. Again, that's number four. Number five we try to keep about a six foot distance from other people when we're out in public. If I'm in a public place, I'm walking through the aisle at the grocery store, I'm trying to pass people at a larger distance than I normally would, about six feet. That's because your average cough or sneeze isn't gonna travel you know, 25 feet, and it's gonna travel very short and fall to the ground. Um, so I try to keep a six foot distance. Now I realize six feet isn't always possible, so my sort of second rule of thumb there is at least three. You think about that grocery store, when you get to the checkout line, you're gonna be standing behind somebody and somebody's gonna be behind you. The good news is the, the person behind you probably has a shopping cart and it's at least three feet long, so they're a good three feet away from you. Same with you and the person in front of you, and if I don't have a cart, I will stand three feet back. The funny thing is, it feels a little socially awkward to do it, but the reality is, People around you understand why and nobody's offended by it. That was number five. Number six, if you are in a public place, airport, movie theater, I'm trying to think of some of those public places. If you're in a public place and you're going to be there for a small period of time, right? An hour, 30 minutes, an hour and a half, but it's a place where a lot of other people have been, Go ahead and take the precautions that make sense to you. We use a set of like Clorox sanitizing wipes. You know, they come in a little tube and you pull each one out, almost like a baby wipe. And we will wipe down the armrest of the movie theater chair. Or I did have to fly a few weeks ago um, and I wiped down the whole tray table and the armrests and the seat belt and the back of the seat of the seat where I was sitting and along the edge of the, um, I was sitting on a window seat, so along the edge of the window. So if I put my arm up and it bumped that, it was a clean surface, it was disinfected. I've canceled a lot of the flights that I have scheduled for now, but um, but obviously, you know, you're going to be in public at some point. Just be smart about it. That's number six. And then number seven is a really important one. Um, I probably shouldn't even have to say it, but if for any reason, me, Deb, or the girls had a cough, a fever, or we didn't feel well, we would not go out in public. Please, if you do, do not go out in public. Remember. 80% of the people that get this disease will recover 100% on their own, but we never know when we're gonna be in public if we're sick and we're around somebody who has an immune deficiency or has a weakened system or is in that elderly bracket or one of those higher risk categories. So just be smart. If you feel anything 
any kind of sickness. Do not go out. That's number seven. So it's not that complicated, right? It's seven items. Stop freaking out. Wash your hands often. Cough into your elbow. Try not to touch your face. If you're in public, clean the area around before you start using it. And lastly, if you don't feel well, don't go out. Seven simple, logical, and practical steps anybody can take. And I think it's gonna make a big difference for me personally and for my family. And I suspect if you do this, it will be the same sort of benefit for you and your family. Now let's talk about outside of ourselves, our communities, our cities, our states, our economy. I think we have to think about that in our approach. And I think there are a few pretty simple things we can all consider and do that will help keep this virus and this pandemic from having consequences beyond just health issues. The first thing, stop stockpiling toilet paper. There is not a need for any person to go into a store and get six, eight, ten packages of toilet paper and buy out all the aisles. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, yes, you need toilet paper. I get it. I'll even argue with you that there are a lot of bidet using countries around this world that have um, good health, they are hygienic, and they have figured out a way to keep their backsides clean with hot soapy water and washcloths and a bidet as opposed to using paper all the time. So yes, we need toilet paper. No, you don't need 75 rolls of it right now. Please buy what you need, take care of your family, but also leave some on the shelves for other people that are gonna need it. It just is, it's mind boggling to me that we see that. If you need supplies, by all means, go to the store and get them. I would just ask that you are considerate to others. I, I was actually in a store yesterday and I did see that they are now limiting the number of items people can purchase in certain categories like toilet paper, paper products, um, hand sanitizer, uh, and I applaud them for that, right? I think that is a great move. I'm glad, I'm glad to see them doing that because clearly the general public isn't self-regulating that, that instinct, if you will. So here's the other thing you can do. Be smart about where you go. I don't think you have to quarantine yourself to your house if you have no symptoms, if you feel fine, if you're not in a risk category. Be smart about where you go, but think about your local businesses, your friends and family that maybe own shops or have employees that work or know people that work in those shops locally. Those businesses are gonna be hit hard from this, very hard. As people worry and freak out and stay home, people are not going to local restaurants as often, local shops where you may go buy clothes. And when that happens, those proprietors that leverage that income to help keep people employed, it has, a, it has an effect. So if they're not getting the income, they start to have to cut down hours and maybe they do the work as opposed to having one of their part-time employees come in, that particular part-time employee may very well need that paycheck for general life-sustaining things like food and house and, and whatnot. Um, just think about that. I don't want us to be unsafe but I also don't want the people in my community not being able to have general necessities like utilities, housing, and food. Um, and I don't wanna be overly dramatic, but that is a possibility. That can absolutely happen. So I would just say, be safe, but do think about your local businesses and figure out how you can help support them in a way that um, doesn't put you and your family or others at risk yet does still help our local economy. And our local economy is important. It feeds our bigger economy and it also feeds your overall um, living standards. There's another item that's really near and dear to my heart and I wanna share it with you. Um, for those that don't know, there are families in your neighborhoods, in your local areas that either have no or low income and their children go to the public schools. And part of children going to public schools with low or no income, they often provide meals to those children. So not only a free lunch at school, but many of those schools also provide free breakfasts. So think about that. Those children are getting two of their square meals per day at the public school. In times like this, where the school is closed for multiple weeks, two, four, six, eight weeks, whatever it may be, I know our local school here, um, they're on a two week summer break right now and they've extended that another week. I know of other schools where they've closed for four and six weeks out. When that happens, these kids may not be getting two of those three meals that most people get every single day. Um, Unfortunately, those families that are, are impacted may be the same folks that are in that situation where they need every single full paycheck to help support that one additional meal they get, and now they're having to provide additional ones, two more every single day. Also, those families may very well have jobs that don't allow them to work remotely. 
and now they're having to either find daycare and or pay for those additional meals, further exacerbating the problem in our local economies. I would ask you, if, there is, if you have the, um, the ability, if you have the additional funds or the time to do this, I would suggest that you look to how you can support uh, needy children in your area for meals, single mother and uh, low income or no income families to support meals for those folks. Your local food bank probably has a program to do this. Even local um, churches and charities probably do as well. Uh, it's one of those things that I think if you either don't have children or you don't know somebody in that situation, you sort of are blind to it. You don't know it's occurring, but I promise you in your neighborhood right now, there are families deciding how they're going to get their children meals right now and what bills or what things they're gonna to have to do without at the end of this month. I, it's already going to be happening, so please, if, if I can just plead this of you, see what you can do. If you can do something, by all means, please do. Um, so that's it. That's really that's our practical approach. It's what we're doing for ourselves to keep ourselves healthy, and it's sort of my thoughts on what does it mean beyond me? How do I think about our economy, our com a community? How do we keep this health issue for individual people from becoming a financial crisis for the country? Um, all of us can play our part in that. We all really can. And I would ask if you have the ability to do that, if you have some of that income that lets you be able to help, keep supporting your local businesses. I'm not suggesting you be risky. I am suggesting that you don't, um, don't be overly paranoid and further, um, uh, further exacerbate the problem that may happen in our community. So sorry to end it on such an oddball note here. Um, if you enjoyed this video, by all means, please give it a thumbs up, share it with somebody that else you think that could, could benefit from this. Um, and next Friday, we will be right back to our standard content. Um, we will share with you how we're continuing all this work back here on Dream Chaser to prepare for our sale across the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico here within the next few weeks, the next month or so. Um, thanks everybody from Gil, from Deb, and the girls aboard the sailing vessel Dream Chaser or in our house, either way, this is what we're doing to stay safe, and I hope you found this video useful. Bye, y'all. Be healthy and be safe.